Hello and welcome back. So in this activity, we are giving an LTI system, the term defined characterized by a set of coefficients, and we only have the B coefficients, so that we know that this is an FIR filter, a finite input response filter, otherwise we will need to have another set of coefficients, and uh, we are asked to determine the frequency response. So let's start with this. So we have BK, these are the coefficients, one, two, one. Okay. Now we know from these coefficients, right? We can go to the difference equation. Y of n is equal to one times x of n plus two x of n minus one plus one x of n minus two. Remember that in general, the difference equation of an FIR filter is given by the BK coefficients x of n minus k. <clears throat> so think of this as a weighted running average from k equals 0 to m. And we have already seen that the B coefficients equals the input response, meaning if we were to put at the input for x of n, we put the delta impulse, what we get as the impulse response is here in the output, right? 1 delta n plus 2 delta n minus 1 plus 1 delta n minus 2. We can Sketch this is this input response. So at zero is equal to one. At one equals to two. At two equals to one. So it is symmetric, and that's actually important. We're going to see. So you can either characterize the, the filter by the B coefficients, that's equivalent to the difference equation, the impulse response, which in the case of an FIR filter, we see that the impulse response equals the B coefficient vector. And what was the frequency response? This is what this activity is asking. What is the frequency response? Well, the frequency response, we have seen that the frequency response of an LTI system is the Fourier transform of what? The impulse response. So all you need to do is find the impulse response, which we have it, right? So, and, and the next thing is which Fourier transform? Well, if it's a continuous time system, it's going to be the continuous time Fourier transform. If it is a discrete time system, it's going to be the discrete time Fourier transform. Continuous time Fourier transform, AX. You have an integral from minus infinity to infinity. Of this signal which you would multiply, multiply times the complex exponentials as basis functions and you are creating something there that looks like an inner product actually it's an inner product if we are going to do this in discrete time it's going to be a function of omega hat the digital frequency, which is normalized. And we have seen that continuous time sums, integrals, becomes discrete summatories, sums, x of all the t's that are continuous variables t becomes x of n, e to the minus j, all the omega the frequencies of continuous time will become the omega hat, the normalized frequencies. And so that's what we have. In this case, 
the system is discrete, so we're going to use our ideal spectrum analyzer for discrete time. Okay. So let's do it. What will be the frequency response? The frequency response for this discrete time system in general will be the discrete time Fourier transform of the impulse response. Now this equation will apply to both finite impulse response filters and infinite impulse response filters. Now, it, if it is infinite, then we know that the impulse response is going to be zero after some value. In this case, we, we can see that we have one, two, one, and then it's, think of it as zero, 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 zero. And so the limits of integration, in the case of an, all FIR filters, are going to be finite. So we have from n equals zero to a particular number, in this case, right? It's going to go to two, and x of n e to the minus j omega hat n. Meaning, you pick this coefficient, this is the first one, and you say, well, one, multiply times e to the minus j omega, this is for n equals zero, think of this as n, position zero, one, two, and remember n is the integer number that gives you the position, gives you the order of the, <coughs> for the discrete time signal. So this n times zero plus 2 e to the minus j omega hat times 1 plus 1 e to the minus j omega hat times 2. And this is equal to, it's equal to 1, of course, so we have 1 plus 2 e to the minus j omega hat plus 1 e to the minus j omega hat times 2. And you could stop here. Notice that although we have a discrete time signal, but when we apply the discrete time Fourier transform, we get a spectrum that is a function of a continuous omega hat. There are an infinite amount of points. Now. Remember, this is not a transform adapted for computation. In order to compute this without having to do this mathematics, directly by having the numbers one, two, three, you can use the discrete Fourier transform, right? Implemented or calculated with a fast algorithm known as the fast Fourier transform. But in this case, if you wanted to see how this behaves, you can, you can plot this as a function of omega hat and do, since it's a, it's a complex number, a, a complex function, you need to do two subplots, one for the magnitude and one for the phase. Now, let's ma manipulate it a little bit so that we get to understand the frequency response a little bit better. One thing that we can do is to factor here the fact that this is e to the minus j omega times e to the minus j omega hat. And we do that, we can factor an e to the minus j omega hat, put here an e to the j omega hat plus e to the minus j omega hat plus 2. We do something like this. What we see, and notice that this factor times this factor gives me 1. This factor times this factor times 2 gives me the 2 minus j omega. And this factor times this factor is what we have seen here. It gives me the last. Okay. Now, the reason for putting it like this is that this, we can put it in terms of sine and cosine, so we can see um, easier the magnitudes and the phases as well as the shape. So this, notice that the cosine of omega, sorry, the cosine of, <coughs> of omega um, 
actually, let me just put it in the rho theta. So sine of theta is equal to one half e j sine of theta plus one half e to the minus j sine of theta. So we don't have here the one half, so this is two cosines. So e to the j omega hat, and we have two plus two cosine of omega hat. That's what we have here, right? And so what we see is that this part, right, is going to be positive from omega hat minus pi to pi, right? This is equal to one, so it's going to give us the phase. Effectively, what we can see is that the magnitude is two plus cosine of theta of omega hat and the angle, and this actually has a minus sign here, so the angle is just going to be this, minus omega hat. So let's let's do a little bit of analysis or plot in this. Think you can evaluate this for different omegas, or if you put here your unit circle, this is zero or two pi, this is pi, this is pi over two. We're talking about a pi equals at omega equals zero, where we are here, this is equal to one. So the magnitude will be two plus, so one over here times two, two plus two. So this looks something like this. At omega equals zero is two. And it's going to, at omega, let's see, when, when is this going to, at omega pi over two, the cosine is going to be zero, and so this is going to be at two. Sorry, here four. Here we have one times two, two plus two, four, a pi over two, pi over two. going to be equal to 2, and at pi, we have minus 1, so we are going to have 2 minus 2, 0, so this is something that we're going to do, something like this, right there. Now the phase is going to be linear as a function of omega. Notice that this is the normalized radian frequency. Notice that this is a continuous function of the normalized radial frequency. We could evaluate it for any value that we want. And remember that this pi corresponds to fs over 2. You're going to put it in here. Pi over 2 is fs over 4. Okay. So this is a low-pass filter, we have seen. Notice what we have done here. Now, for a given set of coefficients, analytically, I mean, in these coefficients, in, in this case, they are an FIR filter. You know that these coefficients are equal to the impulse response of the filter. And you know that the frequency response is equal to the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Which Fourier transform? Well, depends on the system. Uh, if the system is continuous time, you do the continuous time Fourier transform. If it is discrete time, you use the discrete time Fourier transform. This is the same as the continuous time Fourier transform. These two transforms are ideal spectrum analyzers for which you have a mathematical expression for the signal, or in discrete time, even the signal samples, you can evaluate the discrete time Fourier transform. Notice the discrete time Fourier transform gives you something which is a function of continuous omega. Um, it's an analytic, you, should, you are able to compute this. Uh, sorry, compute. You're able to mathematically solve and you get a result for any omega that we have here. If you do some mathematical manipulations, like what we have done here, it is easier to see um, mathematically and analytically how this function is going to behave. However, notice 
that the way you're going to do this practically is going to be with the FFT. So you're going to just apply, I mean, you will do the discrete Fourier transform, evaluate it through the FFT. Notice that the discrete Fourier transform and the FFT are equal. The FFT is just a fast algorithm to do the discrete Fourier transform of this signal there. And you do it through computation using a general purpose processor, like what you have in your computer, or a special purpose processor like a DSP, a dedicated DSP. What you are doing in that case, if I'm to write it here, e to the e to the j omega hat, is evaluating these omega hats at the frequencies that you want of interest. And what we do, since in general you can have frequencies from 0 to 2 pi, You do 2 pi divided by n, the number of points, which if you're using FFT is going to be a power of 2, and then the index. And that will give you out an x of k, where now this is a discrete variable. Okay, So you have, you're evaluated at a finite number of points, and now you are able to compute it. Now in this case, because you have a finite signal to start with, you are not losing anything due to these limits of integration not going from minus infinity to infinity. So it turns out that the discrete Fourier transform is going to be identical to the discrete time Fourier transform at those points that you have evaluated that are this point. So effectively what we are doing, when we are using the, the FFT, is that this function of continuous omega, we will evaluate it at a set of points. Now, since you can do as many as you want, it will look continuous. I mean, just use it for your applica application. The number, this is the computational uh, frequency resolution that you have. Um, <clears throat> so this will be 2 pi over m times k. Or, in terms of frequency, it will be fs divided by n times k. This is how you get the access. And you can double that, that number. You can put enough of them so that you have as much computational resolution as you need in your application. In general, 2 to the two to the 12 is the maximum that you're going to use. Now, incidentally, this we could go from 0 to, to 2 pi, if we wanted, or from minus pi to pi. All these signals are periodic. Between pi to 2 pi, this is going to be symmetric, and that's going to be the case for all these uh, real signals. If the signal was complex, that's not the case, and in which case you want to see uh, both sides. But for if you're analyzing uh, filters, for instance, frequency response of systems for which the coefficients are real, all you need to go is from 0 to pi or from 0 to half of the sampling frequency, as well as for any other real signal that you're analyzing. Thank you.